Welcome to your muscular system. In this video, I'm going to go through the characteristics of muscle tissue, the types, the functions, the structure, and the regulation of muscle contraction. Ready? Let's go. First of all, the characteristics of muscle tissue. There are four. The first one is the unique feature, meaning you only find this characteristic in muscle tissue, and that's contractility, which means muscle tissue can shorten. That's how it moves. So when you see things in the body that are moving, that's muscle. Excitability. It it means that muscle tissue can respond to stimuli and generate action potentials. Now that's not a unique feature. Nervous tissue can do that as well. Extensibility means that muscle tissue can be stretched, right? You can stretch your muscles. And elasticity. That means after a muscle is stretched, it will return to its original shape. Next, the types of muscle tissue in the body, there are three. The first is smooth muscle. The contraction of smooth muscle is involuntary. You'll find it in places like the GI tract. Now you can feel your guts moving, but you can't control those contractions. Cardiac muscle, of course, in the heart. And today we're focusing on skeletal muscle. Extremely unique under the microscope. Look at all of those stripes. And today we're gonna see what all those stripes are about. Next, the functions of skeletal muscle. The obvious one, it's how your body moves. In addition, skeletal muscles help us to maintain posture and stand up against gravity. Skeletal muscle helps support and protect soft tissues. Think about how your abdominal muscles protect your guts underneath. A lot of people forget this one, but we need to guard the body entrances and exits. I'm talking about sphincters, regulation of body temperature, and a nutrient reserve. If you're not taking in enough calories, your body can burn muscle for fuel. The structure of skeletal muscle is next. This can be a little overwhelming. Skeletal muscle pulls on the skeleton indirectly. Muscle doesn't touch the bone. It connects to the skeleton and pulls on it via tendons made of dense fibrous connective tissue. When most muscles contract, the more movable end, which we call the insertion, moves toward the origin or the less movable end. If you look at the biceps brachii, you know that the forearm is moving a lot more than the shoulder, which is the more fixed point. Muscles can only contract, meaning they pull, they don't push. So when you're looking at muscular contraction and you want to know which muscle is doing the work, look for the one that's getting shorter. At a gross level, we've got the whole skeletal muscle connected to the skeleton via tendons. Surrounding the entire gross muscle, we have the epimyceum. Epi, of course, means on top. And then we have bundles of muscle fibers that we call fascicles. This is the strings in stringy meat. So you can see those bundles with the naked eye. Surrounding each bundle, you have the perimyceum. Peri means around around. And if you pull out one of those bundles or fascicles, each one is surrounded by endomyceum. Endomyceum is very thin, it's made of dense, irregular connective tissue, and it basically keeps the skeletal muscle cells happy. It contains capillaries and nerves and helps to keep the concentrations of ions like calcium, sodium, and potassium where they should be so the muscle can function properly. Oh, that satellite cell, by the way, is really important if muscle becomes damaged. The satellite cells are essential for repair. Now, the muscle cells themselves we often refer to as muscle fibers because they are long and skinny. So this sarcolemma, that is just a cell membrane surrounding the muscle cell. The muscle cell or muscle fiber itself is made of even smaller bundles of fibers called myofibrils, which are blown up here. Look how organized and tightly packed everything is. Also notice how many mitochondria there are. Muscle cells require more ATP per gram than any other tissue. Now this is really electron microscope size stuff here. We're looking at sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is going to be really important in the regulation of contraction. It's just specialized endoplasmic reticulum. And then we have two main types of filaments called thick and thin filaments. The thick filament is made of a protein called myosin, and the thin filament is made up of a globular protein called actin, as well as two other regulatory proteins. We'll see how those proteins work together in the regulation of muscle contraction. Muscle contraction is due to really high affinity between two proteins, actin and myosin. So the thin filament is made of, like I said, actin subunits that are twisted together in like a double helical chain. And the thick filament is myosin, which is a long protein that has two globular heads. More than anything, those globular heads of myosin want to bind to the binding sites on actin. If binding sites sites on actin are available, myosin will bind and contraction will occur. If the binding sites on actin are not available, myosin can't bind and
and there is no contraction. So skeletal muscle contraction is all or none. The muscle cell either contracts fully or it doesn't. What does the switch really look like? That's where the other thin filament proteins come in. So we've got the actin subunit, We've got a long skinny protein called tropomyosin, which covers the actin binding sites. We've got globular proteins spaced along the thin filament. Those are called troponin. Now those are kind of easy to confuse. So just remember the small globular protein has the shorter name troponin. The long skinny protein has the longer name tropomyosin. And then here you see the tropomyosin covering those myosin binding sites. What controls myosin's access to those binding sites. I hope you're wondering. The answer is the ion calcium. When calcium is present, it binds to troponin and causes it to change shape. Troponin will cause tropomyosin to slide off the binding sites and expose those binding sites to myosin. So it's a little cascade initiated by calcium. So what controls the level of calcium in a muscle cell? That's what somatic motor neurons do. The release of the neurotransmitter acetylcholine causes another cascade, which ultimately causes the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. We call this excitation contraction coupling. And if you want to know how that works, check out this video. As always, I hope that was helpful. Thank you so much for visiting the Penguin Prof channel. If you learned some good stuff, slam some buttons below. I will see you in the next one. Good luck.